I'm really honored to be able to introduce today uh, Professor Alicia Gavez, who's Professor of Latin America and Latino Studies at Lehman College in, in Bronx, New York City. She has her PhD in anthropology from New York University, and she's the author and editor of numerous books. Um, the one that both Daniel Lopez and I have taught in our classes and inspired us to try to convince Alicia to come today um, was Patient Mothers, Patient Citizens, Mexican Women, Public Prenatal Care, and the Birth Weight Paradox from Rutgers University Press. Her book before that was Guadalupe in New York, Devotion and Struggle for Citizenship Rights Among Mexican Immigrants from New York University Press. And she'll talk today about her brand newly released book, I think it's this month or last month, um, last month. that it's out, um, called Eating NAFTA, Trade, Food Policies, um, and the Destruction of Mexico. She's written numerous articles in the field, and she's directed or co-directed a feature-length film called Salud, Myths and Realities of Mexico migration. And she has just this amazingly long CV, and you would never guess by looking at it, because of all the scholastic accomplishments, that she's incredibly active and engaged in civil um, in civic life as well. And I just wanted to give you a really small example. Um, last week, in the, mix, in the midst of book tours and teaching, uh, when she learned that all the polling places in Dodge City, Kansas, had been closed, leaving a majority of Latinx population to travel well outside the city to vote, she organized a fundraiser. She raised several hundred dollars that secured a driver to drive anyone, regardless of party affiliation, to the polls. She's a deeply committed to student-centered universities, a topic that she often speaks about in public. And as a scholar, she models an academy that's committed to excellence in scholarship, inclusion, and pedagogy, while also being connected to broader activist concerns for social justice. We're really honored to have her with her today, so I'd like to welcome Professor Alicia Galvez. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you, Emily, for uh, the really kind introduction. And I want to thank Emily, Daniel, Gretchen, um, the School of Public Health, uh, all of the people who um, had a role. I know this was a, um, a very collaborative effort, so I'm really um, excited to be here. Um, and it's my first time in Western Oregon, which is very beautiful. So um, thank you for having me today. Um, so today I thought I would talk, um, I was trying to um, figure out the best way to um, bring together um, the ways that this book addresses um, a lot of the fields um, and interests that are represented here in the audience from what I have, have learned. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Mexico's um, health policy, but I'm going to try to give um, some analysis in terms of how it came to be, why it was, um, uh, why it was, um, designed the way that it was and, and what preceded it. Um, so as many of you may know, Mexico has, um, has identified itself as suffering from an epidemic of uh, diabetes. Um, this is from the Mexican Health Ministry. It's just an example of the human um, and economic costs of the diabetes epidemic. Um, so 65 to 70,000 deaths per year uh, to diabetes, um, approximately 13 um, out of 100 deaths um, attributable to diabetes. Um, and then, you know, other statistics in terms of the costs and the, the states that have the greatest concentration um, and, uh, you know, gender breakdown of, of the mortality. Um, this is another example of um, messaging from the Ministry of Health. Um, as far as uh, how, how the number of deaths has risen over time. Um, and uh, it's basically leveled off around 80,000 deaths per year. But we can also see in this slide um, the etiology of the disease as it's being framed by, uh, by the health ministry. So the health ministry has framed the epidemic of diabetes as a problem derived from obesity and overweight. As we can see um, in the top of the slide, 80% of diabetes in Mexico caused by, diabetes, by overweight and obesity. And we can see with the way the, um, the logos are used. Um, and I want to say, just from the start, in, in my book, I critique the premise of a so-called obesity epidemic, um, drawing inspiration from Dr. Emily Yates-Dorr and her cru crucial work 
um, critiquing BMI and other arbitrary metrics that are used to frame and diagnose um, certain sets of, of data points as pathological. Um, and I think, you know, as insidious as, you know, some of the conceptual problems with the metrics are, um, you know, I think it's, it's I'm interested in the, the way that social categories emerge from these metrics that classify people as overweight, obese, ca categories, characterizations that can spill over um, to frame people as undisciplined, careless, reckless, unproductive, a drain on the nation productivity. And so this is what I'll be talking about a lot today in terms of how this kind of framing um, contributes to uh, this understanding of, of people with chronic disease as being kind of bad citizens who cost the nation. Um, and um, so, you know, because I'm sympathetic to fat studies scholars such as Roth Bloom and Solovey, who write about American culture being engaged in a pervasive witch hunt targeting fatness and fat people, um, and a project that's being exported worldwide um, that has racialized aspects that denigrates people who are deemed overweight, obese. Um, and they describe it as an ugly stew of hatreds that comes together in the abhorrence with which we regard fleshly bodies, unquote. Um, and so because of this you know, critique that I see as being in inherent in my, in my work, um, I, I and the and you know the related um, framing of Greenhog, who writes about the health ex healthest expectations of biocitizenship. I did ask myself early on in this project whether I could even whether I could do this work and just not mention obesity, <laughs> just avoid um, using and 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 you know reinforcing that that terminology and that framing. Um, but I ultimately decided that I couldn't engage. Um, and part of the pre-conversation we were having in this room with some of the students in the program, uh, programs uh, is, you know, how do we um, engage with uh, the public on some of these issues? And I realized, you know, I couldn't engage with the government officials or the people who are involved in the design and the uptake of these policies if I wasn't using the same language. So I do use the same language, but I do, did want to start off just with a, a mention of my critique. Um, so here are some of the, you know, the, the ways that, that this is being understood to be a problem, some of the ways that it's being measured. Um, so we can see, you know, from 1990 to 2013, the very rapid rise in diabetes, heart disease, and, and kidney disease um, accompanying, you know, in, in what's called often the epidemiological transition, um, the decline of, of communicable diseases. Um, we can see, uh, you know, the here as well, over a 10-year period, um, same rankings for, for kidney disease, diabetes, and heart disease over 10 years, but, but um, increases, and then uh, accompanying in decreases um, in a lot of the non-communicable statistics. And so we can ask ourselves why. What, is the, what are the factors that are producing this? And so um, this is my ugliest slide, but there's a lot going on that I don't have another way to explain to you. So, um, so Mexico had uh, an idea for itself in terms of its shift, um, which is really exemplified in the North American Free Trade Agreement that came into effect um, January 1st of 1994. And the idea of Mexico's overall development plan, largely envisioned by uh, the Harvard and Chicago-trained economists that were in uh, the government um, at the time uh, to transition from a small-scale agricultural-based economy to a much more um, globalized, um, industrial-based economy. And so um, NAFTA was seen as a part of a, of a process um, that would basically dismantle a lot of the state-organized um, um, protections of, of agriculture and really shift emphasis away from, from agriculture towards, um, towards an industrial economy that was fully um, integrated with the larger North American market, and that this would lead to prosperity development. Um, when we see NAFTA going into effect, uh, one of the side effects of this was anticipated to be so-called de-peasantization. This was seen as a necessary part of the process, but it was imagined that um, approximately 500,000 people would be displaced from their land. Um, I'll talk about 
what happened with that number in a moment. Um, but uh, basically, we can see that, you know, one, um, there was a, a d design to kind of have um, the protections that existed of Mexico's small scale corn growers, for example, be phased out over um, about 20 years um, to, to basically ease the countryside off of government support and um, promote other kinds of, of economic activity as people moved from rural areas to the cities and from one sector into other sectors. Um, but almost immediately, uh, there was a corn deficit that was diagnosed. Um, I put this in scare quotes because um, the, this was essentially um, a, you know, a trick of um, certain people in the government ministries that identified um, a need for there to not be a, a limit to corn imports from the United States almost immediately, right? So, so Mexico had this idea, we need to protect our domestic corn supply from the cheap corn coming from the United States. Corn is super important. It's not just our main staple food. It's symbolically important. We need to protect it. And um, when I first got into this project, I knew about the protections. What I didn't know was that those protections had been suspended almost immediately because of this so-called diagnosis of a corn deficit. And so we start seeing um, you know, about 8 million tons of, of corn from the US pouring into Mexico very quickly. And a lot of that corn, if you're familiar with the differences in US corn um, compared to, to you know, small scale corn, it's, uh, it's grain corn that's grown mostly for industrial purposes. It can't be eaten right off of the stock. Um, and it's uh, mostly used for animal feed, sh starches, uh, sweeteners, et cetera. Um, the prosperity that was promised, uh, Mexico has had stagnant levels of prosperity, still about 52% of the population today. Um, it's gone down three or four percentage points over the course of NAFTA, um, while in countries that didn't have a trade deal, poverty has gone down double digits. Um, we've seen a rise in the price of tortillas, decline in consumption of tortillas, rise in diabetes. Um, and we see this you know, diagnosis by the federal government of um, an epidemic of diet-related disease, leading to a multi-sectoral strategy for prevention and control of overweight, ob overweight ob obesity, and diabetes. Um, and then we also see, of course, the new NAFTA, which is the UMCA, which is just um, not yet approved, but has been uh, laid on the table. Um, so this is an overall system that favors an industrialized food system, favors multinational food and beverage corporations, among other corporations. Um, that uh, many of these trends preceded NAFTA, but we can see that NAFTA dealt a decisive blow to past more protectionist phases of economic and social policy in Mexico. Um, so I want to give you know a glimpse of kind of what what is being lost? <laughs> what is this corn culture that is being threatened by these shifts? Um, there are still obviously a lot of people who grow corn in Mexico, but they typically do it. This is a town that describes themselves as stubborn, um, as kind of un, um, unnoticed by the federal government, um, neglected by the federal government. So they grow corn, um, but with very little to no support from uh, the larger uh, government. Um, but this is an example of corn growers. Um, one of these slides, there's somebody wearing an Oregon hat. Um, people from this town migrate to Oregon, um, Nevada, and New York. Um, so uh, father and son um, drying the mazorcas, uh, which will be saved um, in order to, uh, to eat throughout the season until the next harvest. Um, here we have a corn molino. Um, a lot of the people that I know in um, Mexican migrant communities in New York, um, their project that they're saving for is often to buy a molino. A molino has been considered, you know, one of the things that will never go out of style um, in their rural community. It's a good investment. Um, this is an electric molino, um, and the corn is nixtamalized overnight um, and then uh, soaked. And then it's in the morning, it's put through the molino, and the masa that emerges can be used for tortillas, tamales, tacoyos, et cetera. Um, all of this is centered on what is called the milpa based diet. The milpa is the, the intercropped um, uh, 
har um, uh, grow farming of chiles, corn, and squash, as, as well as wild greens, um, which has been really the heart of the Mesoamerican diet um, for thousands of years. Um, it persisted even after you know the arrival of the Spanish, who introduced wheat and uh, large uh, d domesticated livestock. Um, and it certainly altered a lot of aspects of the diet, but this core, these core elements really um, remained, and only in the last arguably 25 years have really faced their greatest threat. Um, this is the product. The, the next thing that happens after the masa comes out of the molino, my friend's mother is um, making memelas in her household outdoor kitchen in Santa Tomas de Alta in Puebla State. Um, the comal is clay, it's over a wood fire, um, and she makes the memelas and then puts um, usually salsa and cheese. Here's an example um, of the memelas when they're finished and ready to eat. Um, also in this region, we see um, historically a lot of uh, farmer's markets. Um, this is Piaxla, Tehuacan, which is near the, the town that I just was showing slides from, um, was one of the market capitals. Um, going back well before the Spanish, Tehuacan was a market center um, for the region. People would come from very different altitudes, different agricultural communities, bringing a great variety of products. Um, now, a lot of these markets that, you know, obviously were built um, to kind of be in an institutionalized structure, a very fixed permanent structure, now have maybe half of the space is, is with vendors and the number of market spaces has been dramatically reduced. Um, this is another example in um, Merida and Yucatan. Um, very vibrant, but as you can see, not very bustling, um, and uh, only again, about half the stalls um, occupied. Um, this is another example of, you know, kind of how people um, eat uh, in ways that are being increasingly threatened. Uh, this is just a street vendor's cart in the city of Puebla selling fresh cucumber, um, papaya, pineapple, and coconut with lime and chile. Um, and then here we see a tortilleria, right, which is where, you know, increasingly people are no longer eating as many tortillas, and they're not necessarily um, making them themselves. Um, but tortillerias have been around for a long time. Um, many of them would have had the, the molino and then had a machine making the tortillas or have people making tortillas by hand. Now increasingly the few tortillerias that remain uh, use maseca, which is the dried crown, uh, dried ground sacks of corn flour that you can see stacked up behind the bottles, um, lasts forever. There's no nixtamalization. They've been uh, nixtamalized um, in theory uh, already um, before being ground, but they, but, um, you know, it's kind of in imperishable. Um, there was a recent scandal a couple of weeks ago where a lot of um, glyphosate was discovered to be um, and very high levels in the maseca ground flour, even though Roundup is and uh, GMO corn is, is um, not technically supposed to be grown except for experimental purposes in Mexico. Um, so either uh, U.S. corn is being used in the maseca or they're growing um, corn in spite of the embargo um, coming from Monsanto. Um, so this is a uh, now I'm going to walk through how, you know, there's the, the ways of using corn. That, um, that are still very visible and present, but every day less visible, less present, um, and how that is transitioning. So this is Doña Yolanda, who's in um, Santa Tomas Tlalpa also. Um, she's a widow um, who's had her little tiendita for 23 years. Um, and she says mainly she has it because she gets bored and she doesn't want to be cooked up in the house. Um, but the tienda, you know, if people, uh, when I talk to people, Mexican migrants in the U.S., um, who are saving for a project. A molino is one idea, tiendas are another idea that people are usually um, quite keen to have because they imagine having a good retirement, having a little tienda in one room of their house, um, selling local products. So as you can see, she's got a pack of a kilo of fresh tortillas on the counter. Um, she has a tortilleria that brings a cooler of hot tortillas that she'll sell. Um, but other than that, <coughs> she doesn't have anything fresh. Um, or perishable. Um, all of the products are basically packaged, including the milk, um, shelf-stable, 
Um, and these tiendas are usually outfitted with shelling and refrigerators and signage from, in this case, Bimbo, but they might be Coke, Pepsi, with exclusive distribution rights. So tienda owners, you know, make a deal to only sell a certain kind of product and they get all of the equipment that they need to open the tienda. Um, Nonia Yolanda said when she first opened it, she really liked to sell, um, you know, kind of fruit spears like the street vendor that we saw, cucumbers or mangoes to kids coming home from school. But she said her neighbors complained that they were too expensive and they would go bad very quickly. So she stopped doing that. She also would have no way of getting those products. So um, Coke or Pepsi or Bimbo bring the products to her. She doesn't have to go anywhere. Um, but if she wants to do fresh fruit or vegetable, she has to get on a public bus and carry it herself um, and then sell it at a markup from the retail prices that she has to pay um, to produce that. And it's just not worthwhile anymore. And she said it used to be that people would buy their ingredients for dinner from her. She said no one does that anymore because um, there are four Walmarts in Tehuacan now, and uh, everybody goes, they go once a week to Tehuacan, they do all their shopping at Walmart, and they'll only buy, the kids mostly buy from her candies and after-school snacks. This is OXO. OXO opens three stores a day in the Republic of Mexico. It's the fastest growing retail food environment. Something like 80% of food sales now happen in convenience stores or supermarkets. Um, about 20 years ago, it was the exact opposite. 80% um, was happening at farmers markets and tiendas. Um, Oxo is ubiquitous um, across the Republic. And like, you know, 7-Eleven, places like that, it's designed to be um, easy for people in cars. They're on highways. They're usually attached to a gas station. It's an easy place to get Coke or, uh, or beer, ice, coolers, potato chips. Um, but again, nothing, nothing fresh. Um, this is Walmart, which is, you know, in many of our imaginations, probably the maximi maximum expression of globalized commerce. Um, it's the second largest retailer in Mexico. Um, so this is sort of what NAFTA did to the landscape in terms of how the food system is structured, um, how people's lives are sort of more oriented around the globalized um, corporate models. Um, but there's also been a very human cost. And so uh, like the corn farmers that I showed you whose family members are in Oregon and Nevada and New York, um, many people were displaced as a result of these trends. Um, so these are Pew research uh, statistics. Um, Pew tends to err even on the little, uh, a little on the side of conservatism. A lot of people say the numbers are probably closer um, to 10 million. But according to Pew, we see um, just in the 1995 to 2000 period, which is the immediate post-NAFTA period, um, 2.3 million uh, net Mexican immigrants to the U.S. So after the back and forth, 2.3 million. Um, and then we see, you know, the peak from 19 between two, uh, so this is 1995 to 2000, and then 1995. This is the same. And then uh, 2005 to 2010, we see a, um, the number coming from Mexico to the U.S. Don't tell, you know, the president hasn't seen these um, statistics, but, you know, there are fewer people coming than leaving, um, but we still see significant numbers of people um, in, that, in that period. So ultimately, you know, experts estimate between um, 5 and 10 million Mexican nationals um, migrating to the U.S. between 1995 and really tapering off, almost halting with the 2008 recession. Um, so going back a few slides, the Mexican government anticipated a half million. They were off by a factor of 5 to 10, depending how we count. Um, very, uh, very massive um, dislocation, displacement from the countryside. Um, with NAFTA, there was an initial... Um, idea of NAFTA, well, I talked to the group that was here before about the initial, initial idea of, of NAFTA, but once NAFTA got to the um, three-part Canada-U.S.-Mexico negotiating table, um, there was an initial idea that this would be a deal that would basically take down the barriers um, between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Um, the United States, in the very first sitting down said, we are not talking about people. We can talk about mobility of capital, we can talk about mobility of goods, but mobility of people are off the table, right? So 
Um, that immediately made NAFTA be unlike, you know, something like the European Union. You know, there were, there's sort of a vocabulary of there being a unified North American market. Um, but if it were truly unified, then people would circulate as freely as, as goods and capital, but that was taken off of the table immediately. So one of the metaphors I use is that it was a three-legged stool that had one leg removed immediately. So it's always been wobbly. And this is where we see what happened with the third leg removed. People are displaced, but they're displaced in a way that makes them very vulnerable, um, unable to circulate uh, with authorization, unable to regularize their status. And so it created a semi-permanent um, Mexican uh, population without documents in the United States, in addition to the, to the millions of people who do have documents. Um, okay. So we'll come back to that. Um, so I want to talk about um, what's happening in terms of the, um, the, the behind the scenes, what's producing that, that you know, Walmartization, supermarketization, um, what kinds of policies exist um, that are supporting that? So we can see, for example, um, Con Mexico, which is a government agency um, that exists to expand the reach of consumer products throughout the Mexican Republic, uh, lower barriers for trade and distribution, democratize consumption, even in the most marginalized communities. Um, in the book, I, am at, I analyze in more detail um, the ways that this is a consumption model of economic participation um, that's really premised on a certain vision of, of um, who, who the public is, right? So we see sort of the you know, white, uh, middle class, um, discerning consumer, nuclear family um, in the supermarket, you know, reading nutrition labels, um, you know, this sort of vision of, of a consumer-oriented um, um, navigation of, um, you know, this kind of plethora of products, right? It's the consumer who, at the moment of walking down this aisle of every possible conceivable um, variety of product, has to exercise uh, the responsible choice about what she's putting into the basket. Um, and this is, you know, we'll come back to that because that's basically how the health policy is framed, too. Um, and so, you know, if we look sort of, you know, how the U.S. has, has um, expanded into Mexico with NAFTA, we see prior to NAFTA very minimal U.S. investments in Mexican food industry. Um, and then getting ready for NAFTA in 1993, there's an expansion and anticipation of the, of the bonanza that's coming. And then we see by 1999 just this massive... Um, expansion of U.S. investments in Mexican food industry. And we can see that the U.S., you know, compared to other countries, is, you know, investing far more heavily. Um, and we can see a steady increase in the sale of processed foods in Mexico as well. Um, one example, one product that we can look at is uh, sugars, syrups, and sweeteners. Um, Mexico is fam has a famously um, proud and... Um, prickly uh, sugar industry, local national sugar industry of cane sugar. Um, and so most of the U.S. sugar that gets into Mexico is actually, uh, is actually corn syrups and corn sweeteners. Um, and we can see a massive increase in that. Um, and if we compare this, you know, again, the mantra correlation is not causation, but if we compare how this correlates to, to diabetes, we can see this uptick over time of diabetes deaths, and we see that it, you know, has a, a pretty similar arc uh, to, the up, uh, to the increase of the sale of processed foods. Um, you know, visually, when we, when we sort of look around, we can see, um, for example, how infrastructure is um, oriented towards this expansion of a certain consumer model of development. Um, this is um, a town that didn't have a paved road once the road was paved. It's the Coca-Cola company, Coca-Cola truck, you know, bringing, restocking the tienditas that's the first vehicle to use the, the road. Um, and then we can see, you know, just a ubiquitous availability of processed foods, um, sometimes side by side with traditional foods. So at the stand, we see playudas and aguas frescas um, alongside re refrescos, sodas, and, and um, dorilocos, which are an, a monument to human ingenuity, a work of art, and an abomination <laughs> all in one. 
um, you slice open a bag of burritos and you pile them with all kinds of other ingredients, wonderful and, and terrible at the same time. Um, okay, so, and then we, so we have this, you know, sort of framing of this, um, of this health crisis. Um, and so we see Mexico responding in February, in uh, 2014, the federal government of Mexico developing this strategy for prevention and control of overweight, obesity, and diabetes. Again, the framing of those three as being one and the same um, are being so linked that they need to be addressed by the same policy. The campaign is multi-sectoral. It includes the health ministry, the welfare system, the Department of Education, and other um, uh, other parts of the government. Um, the strategy famous incl famously includes a soda tax that's been hailed as being powerfully uh, progressive and innovative by, by many international analysts. Um, but we can see with this campaign, and this is one of the, this is outside the health ministry, the main office, um, but you see this all over the, the republic. Um, we can see a framing of the issue of diet-related illness as a problem rooted in individual behavior to be solved with um, different individual behavior. Uh, so excess consumption is seen as, as the cause, um, not the wholesale restructuring of the economic, social, political landscape. Um, so problems of overconsumption um, are solved with different or reduced consumption. Uh, so diet, light, reduced fat, low sugar products um, become the solution um, or in, you know, Beyond that, if that doesn't work, insulin, glucose testing kits, all of the other kinds of products um, that address those who are sick. Um, so it's better to prevent, um, get yourself checked, right? Medical checks, mídate, moderation when you're eating, and then muévete. So move, get, move your body, get exercise. These are the solutions to diet-related illness. Um, this is an example of educational materials. This is from a private foundation, Fundación Chesperito, which got a deal, which is very rare. Most, most of the time, nobody distributes anything in the public schools, which are federally um, run with a federal curriculum in Mexico and, and very protected in terms of what gets inside. Um, but this uh, foundation was able to make a deal to circulate these, um, these curricula for each grade level. This is the first grade curriculum. Um, Healthy kids uh, feed ourselves correctly. Um, combine the three groups, the food groups and your food. Um, remember to include uh, fruits and vegetables in your snack and drink plain water. Um, so the child is the decision maker. The child is the decider, the one making their own snack. Um, the first grader is deciding what to drink. Um, you know, there's this decontextualization of um, Decision making um, of the family, of the community, of food ways, right? The yogurt sandwich and, and banana, you know, don't look Mexican. <laughs> um, there's no sort of cultural specificity to, um, to the, the, the way that this is being um, communicated. Um, and we see, you know, teachers doing their own versions in terms of their own curriculum. Um, this is a school activity, also first grade, you know, the proper plate fruits, vegetables, uh, grains, uh, fats, and animal protein. So we see this sort of, you know, hyperactivity. Everywhere you go, you sort of see this um, really uh, visible um, discussion. You know, even in the, I was walking from the subway to the health ministry, people were talking about, you know, did you weigh yourself this morning? You know, it's sort of this kind of ev everyday um, discussion. Um, so the Mexican anti-obesity strategy is consonant with the approach that summarized here. It's going to be impossible for you in the back. I'll walk you through it to see the letters. Um, but this is an infographic from the Lancet special issue on global obesity in 2015. Um, and I, I argue that this is, you know, a very similar framing of, of the issue of, of the epidemiological transition, of the rise in, in non-communicable diseases. Um, to Mexico's uh, health policy. Um, so in 2011, in contrast, the Lancet had, an, I think, its first special issue on the rise in global obesity, and it, pulled, it didn't pull any punches. Um, the, the framing, the blame was placed squarely on political and economic shifts that accompany globalization. 
So, quote, the simultaneous increases in obesity in almost all countries seem to be driven mainly by changes in the global food system, which is producing more processed, affordable, and effectively marketed food than ever before. This passive overconsumption of energy leading to obesity is a predictable outcome of market economies predicated on consumption-based growth. So this is 2011, really uh, firm, clear, not uh, at all um, hedging, um, condemnation of the way that corporate uh, consumption-based uh, growth and, and the collaboration between governments and, and corporations for this model of economic growth is responsible for the epidemiological transition. Um, and that issue very closely corresponded to kind of, um, uh, you know, ideas like Thomas Frieden's uh, Healthy Impact Pyramid. Um, he was the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Commissioner, um, later director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. The idea that um, efforts to address the socioeconomic determinants of health at the systemic or structural level are most likely to have the greatest impact and return on investment, while ind individual education and behavioral change um, are at the top of the pyramid um, with the least you know, potential for change. Um, so that was sort of 2011. By 2015, we see the Lancet shifting toward a greater emphasis on the original, on the individual. That shift was not supported by data. Um, the Lancet describes obesity um, in ways uh, that its ideologies of obesity have global influence as a, a, a journal with such, um, such reach and power. Um, and we can see it moving away from laying, laying the blame for the rise in diet-related illness on the expansion of markets for processed foods, on market-based economic policies, on changing food systems. And instead, we see it hedging with language about multifactorial causes, multi-pronged solutions. Um, while they re rightly acknowledge that no phenomenon is widely spread and complex, as these can be reduced to single causes or solutions, the shift away from pointing fingers is exactly what corporations have lobbied for with, law with lawmakers and advocated for with proprietary research and sponsored research programs. So we can see in this infographic, <coughs> it is multifactorial, right? We see go governments right at the top. We see food producers, there's a notion of the food system, there's a notion of the structural interaction between different parts of the economy. We see retailers and schools, but what's at the heart? The individual, right? So it, it boils back, um, you know, not even families, <laughs> right? It's the individual who is the, the decider, um, the decision maker, um, influence each other as care models, as, as role models, caregivers, and peers, right? So this kind of, um, in, in this case, visual reinforcement of this idea that it all boils down to what an individual does or doesn't do, and that being the location for intervention. Um, and this relates to what we see in the Mexican health policy, which I argue is very similar to this framing from the Lancet. So this is a um, mother is lining up outside of school, um, part of the health ministry's all new policies included banning um, kiosks outside of schools um, and the notion that the kiosks are only selling junk food. And so if they banned the kiosks, then um, mothers would step in and bring their, their children food. And you do see in many rural environments, these are all filled with delicious hot meals um, that women typically, I didn't ever see someone who wasn't a woman, um, deliver to their children. Sometimes you see the little mouths lined up. The schools don't let them inside. Like the mouths lined up on the fence and the mother spooning the food through the fence. Um, but I asked the health minister, so you ban the kiosks, uh, the deputy health minister um, who I interviewed. Um, you ban the kiosks. What happens? A mother steps in. What if the mother works? There's always a woman. What woman? Another woman. So there's this sort of um, implicit, what I call mother blame, I don't call it mother blame, building on scholars who, who uh, um, trace this you know, notion throughout Latin America and, and many other parts of the world of this sort of naturalized association between women and, and health and hygiene and 
protection of their families and being the ones that are that are making or breaking the food environment in the home. And so there's this idea that you know women will step in and they'll go back to cooking, right? Because they no longer have the kiosks um, available to, to provide their kids with a snack at school. But of course, a lot of mothers and a lot of parents don't live in the same household with their children. Um, there's an incredible amount of precarity of people divided by migration or just by working or commuting long distances. Um, and so it's unclear what kind of solution this is. Um, there was a, par a pilot program uh, that was part of this new policy where mothers were given funds by the health ministry um, in a few schools. You know, you prepare the hot meal for all the kids in the school. And the deputy health minister told me, Era peor. it was worse. It was terrible. These women don't know how to make a healthy meal. So there's this sort of reinforcing notion that that healthy meals um, are, are difficult, that people require um, nutrition education and training in order to properly know how to do this, but it is their responsibility still somehow to do this. So there's this sort of paradoxical idea of it being their responsibility and also out of their um, capacity, um, which is very problematic, but it also succeeds in deflecting the blame from the larger structural environment in terms of what's not being provided. Um, uh, in economic, social, political terms, but also just even in the schools as far as potable water and healthy food. Um, so we see overall Mexico's strategy to, um, to address obesity and diabetes is a small piece of a larger economic and political context in which funding for public health care has been diminished. Um, many people struggle to pay the costs of diabetes, kidney diseases, and related illnesses. Um, one of the you know, biggest things that a lot of the migrants that I know in New York um, remit money for is precisely health treatments that are not covered um, by their family members' um, health coverage in Mexico. Um, but at the same time, we can see a public investment in things like Zumba and yoga classes in the public parks um, and a, a coupling of this as sort of health policy. Um, I was recently told by one woman who is a health educator in Guanajuato that in one community, um, anyone with so-called uncontrolled glucose levels was um, actually prescribed, given a prescription to attend four aerobics classes per week. Um, so we see this sort of um, supplanting of these kinds of things um, as health policy. Uh, I'm going to wrap up in the next couple of minutes. I just want to um, imagine what other ideologies it might look like if we thought about this in a different way. Um, one would be to um, consider in a single frame the transformation of the countryside, migration, and the trauma of families displaced from the land and separated in some cases by borders, um, and think about ways that um, for example, Emily Mendenhall's work on the syndemics of diabetes, um, the strikingly high correlation um, between diagnoses of diabetes with violence, immigration, depression, and abuse. Um, we have to bring to our analysis of diabetes and chronic diseases a trauma-informed ideology that considers non-communicable disease a kind of structural violence that disproportionately impacts those who are most disproportionately impacted by the economic and social and political changes wrought by NAFTA. Um, those of you who are here in the pre-session, we saw a little clip of, of uh, a film that I helped make that um, the woman on the left uh, lives in the Bronx. Um, her mother on the right uh, lived in Santa Tomas Tlalpa. They didn't see each other for 17 years when the mother passed away from diabetes-related complications. Um, and she had uh, diabetes, uh, gestational diabetes during her pregnancies. Neither of them had any um, sort of uh, family history that they knew of diabetes. Um, but both of them battling, you know, in different parts of the world. Manuela, um, uh, sorry, I sometimes get student um, she uh, attributed her gestational diabetes to her mother not being with her during her pregnancies, um, not there to cook for her, not there to provide her with the home remedies um, that she expected to have when she was pregnant and had her, her children. Um, her mother actually sent herbs and things through a, um, one of these private paqueteros, a, a, a delivery, delivery service, um, and her husband did a lot of the things that a midwife would typically do. Um, in the postpartum period um, with the instructions from its mother-in-law. 
This is another family um, that lives not far from them in Puebla who um, uh, also attributed their, uh, their health issues to their children having left um, more than 11 years prior um, to North Carolina. They had grandchildren who don't speak Spanish, who get on the phone with them, talk to your grandmother, but they can't communicate with each other. Um, and they directly attributed their health trouble to this sadness. Um, and this is a priest who um, is in charge of um, the migrant pastoral project of the Catholic diocese in Puebla, um, who basically said what syndemics say. Um, diabetes is the disease of the migrant, not because migrants change the way they eat, but because it is a somatization of pain, trauma, and depression. Um, and I think we need to pay increasing attention to the ways that these kinds of transformations of people's lifestyles, of people's ability to live in the ways and with the people um, that they care about um, has an effect on the body, right? So he, um, he, he goes into more detail. I could share this with you later if you want, um, you know, how, how he sees the mechanics of this playing out. Um, and then we have social movements. So we have people who are advocating that corn be considered again, um, you know, part of Mexico's patrimony, something to be defended, um, like you know the Mexico Re Mexican Revolution's commitment to land or death. Um, this sort of um, rearticulation with the new presidency. This is the new, the newly um, designated uh, minister of Sagarpa, which is the the rural. Um, ministry, the land ministry, um, who's talked about wanting uh, Mexico to be food sovereign again, um, to put corn um, back on the table as something that Mexico needs to produce for itself. Um, correlating with the social movements in Maíz no hay país, um, this idea of um, of the attachment to corn being not only um, something that's culturally important, that's, that's important to health, that's important to the economy. Um, and then we see not from the Mexican health ministry, but we see from the private sector um, certain sorts of efforts to um, promote you know, superfoods like amaranth um, as a way to, to be healthy in a, in a culturally specific and relevant way, you know, these sort of cooking classes and amaranth farming collectives. Um, we see some of this happening in the Andes with quinoa, um, these sort of assertions. Sometimes this is a more, you know, kind of high-end one where somebody, I think, went to pastry school and wants to make amaranth pastries, but we also see it happening um, in humble communities as well. Um, and then these sort of binational, um, this is from, uh, from California, um, you know, binational efforts to, to, to think about how um, Decolonization, how uh, prior to, to uh, European arrival on the continent, um, this way of eating had health benefits, that, that, that there's been a chipping away, um, not in a good direction, um, with the addition, with colonization and this, and this drive towards more animal um, proteins and fats and, uh, and dairy and, and chemicals and ways of dealing with the land that are, that's, you know, maybe if we just eat in a way that's pre-colonial, we um, maybe can address some of these health issues in addition to having the cultural um, bonds. Um, so I'll close with this image, which is uh, something that was shared by the same authors of Decolonize Your Diet, um, Beta Malada. Thank you. Lecture, and I'm a little bit confused on your statement about uh, Mexico having some form of stagnation of prosperity since the 1990s. The nation's poverty rate is more than half. The GDP per capita is nearly triple. The income per capita is more than double. Uh, and then, as remark, where are you getting the poverty statistics? Poverty statistics, World Bank, multiple. Yeah, countries. they. I I've looked at them too. They're. Well, I'd like to see what you're looking well, at because that's not what I've it's seen. Not the, okay, it's not just those number indicators, but you've even noted it yourself. Uh, increased in paved roads, increase in, in agricultural production. I mean, yes, you're right that there are definitely some downsides to having shifts in diet that cause some obesity. But in many ways, isn't it much better to have a uh, society with overnutrition than one that is starving? 
Well, I think that people, I don't think that um, diet-related illness was something that was anticipated as a potential side effect of NAFTA. I don't think it would be fair to expect the negotiators of NAFTA to have anticipated this. Um, I think this is something that has emerged um, more recently than those negotiations. Um, and so I think now, in the future, you know, it's something that certainly should be put on the table for future trade negotiations. But I don't, th I, I'm, not, I'm definitely not saying this is something they should have thought of in advance. However, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, do, do I, I personally don't think many of the na negotiators, if told, um, you know, 80,000 people might be dying a year from diabetes, you don't have that epidemic happening now, it's going to be happening perhaps as a result of these things, would that be considered collateral damage? Would that be considered an acceptable price? They considered 500,000 people being displaced from the countryside an acceptable price. Would they have considered the 10 million to actually be an acceptable price? You know, these are the sorts of um, trade-offs, the devil's bargains that are, they're sometimes characterized as um, that come with these things. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, hindsight's 2020. What are we going to do in the future? How are we going to address this? And also, how are we going to make sure that um, people are at the table whose interests are are being heard? So corporations have kind of created these deals in such a way that they're really made to order to serve their interests. But small-scale agricultural producers in all three countries, um, you know, the recent USMCA negotiation, can Canadian, Canadian dairy producers were terrified, right? They, were, they, were, they managed to get their concerns heard, um, but they saw, you know... To be fair, Canadian dairy producers are terrible producers. I lived on a Canadian border this summer. We literally have entire towns that are filled with, uh, and just gas stations filled with cheese and butter because dairy prices are so high in Canada. So I right. mean, if you want to talk about helping dairy producers, just think about the consumer. Canadian right. Consumers literally can, from the can I just see if there's other questions? Yeah. Have you looked at the influence of, like, the, at least Swan from Phoenix? Um, uh huh. And there's like this new like boom of PMP fats where it's uh, like Los Locos and uh -huh. like new snack, like fresh Mexican snacks. Coke, yeah. probably right? Do yeah. they sell Mexican yes. Coke? Yeah, yeah. So have you looked into like that or at all? No, I'm going there in a couple of days, so I will look out for that. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean that's I do look in the book actually at the at the what I see as being the completely um, I. I I knew it was simultaneous, but I didn't see them as connected, and I came to, and through my analysis and research, to see them as connected. The rise, the stratospheric rise in popularity and price of menpa-based cuisine, you know, being sold at places in New York City. We have Cosme, where you can spend two hundred dollars for a for a taco dinner, essentially. Um, you know, uh, Rene Redzepi, the Michelin starred, um, you know, D Danish chef who decided that tortillas were, you know, the perfect food and then went to Mexico and did a tortilla sabbatical. I mean, you know, these things are, are becoming, you know, really popular in kind of global elite foodie circles. And I saw that happening at the same time, and I was I, I was sort of seeing it as kind of being like two unrelated weird things, um, and I came to see them as being part and parcel um, because you can't charge, uh, you know, Rene Redzev they said, you know, um, the story of tortillas hasn't been told properly, but once it, once it is, people will pay eighty euros the way they'll pay eighty euros for hand rolled pasta in Italy. Um, so there's this idea of this kind of speculation and, and piracy, I argue, um, in terms of certain kind of elite positioned uh, chefs and, and their, you know, the related industry, the food writers and magazines and food shows and all of that kind of lifting um, this kind of cuisine because it's falling out of reach of everyday people, right? Because if it were ubiquitous and available and affordable, it wouldn't you couldn't charge that much for it, right? And so these are the kinds of things that you used, you know, people, I have a lot of people when they hear my talk say, oh, I drove down the Pan American Highway and we ate like that every, you know, few miles we would stop for tacos and the tortillas were handmade. And, you know, the, because it's falling out of reach, um, is, it, it, it's available for this kind of co-optation and, and circulation in a different kind of economy based on scarcity. Um, and that's really problematic because it's um, taking it away from people to whom it 
originally belongs. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's, we can discuss further, but I want to hear more questions. We can talk about it later. If you want. Um, is health lobbying like, being included in the new talks about different trade agreements? So they um, actually excluded um, nutritionists from the health ministry's discussion of the soda tax. Um, nutritionists were sort of in on the ground floor. And then once the talks got a little more controversial, they kicked them all out. Um, but industry was still represented. Um, and in the U.S. too, you know, we see with USMCA, with NAFTA, you know, there are these very small um, negotiators who are deputized to do this behind closed doors with fast track authority that Congress gives them because they know that if these things were discussed in an open forum that they wouldn't get it done. Um, and so there's this kind of behind closed doors care, uh, aspect to, to the way these things happen. And no, largely health, you know, advocates are not at the table. We aren't at the table, right? Unless you're a billionaire. <laughs> um, we are not at the table. Um, our interests are not really being considered. Um, so it's not necessarily about, you know, do Canada dairy growers or, or, you know, corn farmers in Mexico deserve something special that nobody else gets? Or is it about, you know, do people, should people have the means to, to, to grow corn if it's what their, their family has always done? Should they have to stop, right? <laughs> should it be impossible? Or should it still be possible, right? Not everyone's going to want to do it. Most of us are probably not going to go. I know I should not be trusted to grow anything living, and <laughs> certainly not have my, you know, ability to eat dependent on it. But you know, it shouldn't be so hard for people who want to to do that to make a living at it. Yeah. Go for it. Um, so, from what I know of NAFTA, when it was first being discussed and developed. There was a lot of arguments that Mexico probably shouldn't even be included because China or not China, Canada and America were so developmentally different mm -hmm. than Mexico. Do you think that's played a role in kind of the exploitation? Of Absolutely. Mexico? Absolutely. And do you think that as they're going forward, should Mexico be separated and we should just focus on a US Canada agreement so this doesn't go further? Or is it gonna is it too far? Have we I mean I I think we've gone too far. I found myself in the paradoxical position when um, our president was saying that he was just going to rip it up, of saying, like, please don't rip it up. I just wrote a whole book crit criticizing NAFTA, but I don't want you to rip it up. Um, because because there is so much integration regionally, and, and a lot of livelihoods depend on it. A lot of people are being left out. A lot of people have not seen the gains. But there is a, a lot of integration in that you can't just undo that overnight um, in a reckless way. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, there is an inherent inequality in the deal. And if, if it were a situation where it was um, an open economy, right, if we weren't simultaneously trying to, to build a wall and throw people out at the same time that we wanted to collaborate on business, um, maybe we would have, you know, a, a more balanced situation because people historically went back and forth across the border in response to the demand, supply and demand of, of work. Um, and so the economic market was a little bit more attuned, the, the labor market was more attuned um, to such things and people had more freedom to come and go based on what, where jobs were. Um, now we've sort of we have this very paradoxical um, and contradictory thing where we are, you know, basically prohibiting and criminalizing human mobility um, at the same time that we're sort of all about, you know, kind of capital mobility. And so I think that's really problematic. And the U.S. did, you know, Mexico wanted the deal. Mexico was looking for a deal in Europe um, before arriving at any sort of initiation of conversation with Canada and the United States. And the U.S. kind of had to be dragged eventually to, to the conversation. And once they were um, involved in the conversation, they proceeded to bully Mexico. They would say, we want this. And they, then they would walk out the door and say, we're not coming back unless you say yes to the thing we just told you we want. And then they did this. There, there's a great book, How the Deal Was Done, um, that describes you know, all the grandstanding and performative aspects of how the US basically you know, threatened to walk away every few minutes <laughs> in order to get exactly what the US wanted um, at great expense to, to Mexico. So maybe we'll um, wrap up, and we have a wonderful reception. Er, in the, do questions usually go longer? I don't know if this, if 
expect an hour, so it's okay that you have lunch to the mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we have a yeah. We're hoping, that, though, is there is a food out here. And, Thank you. And so we are hoping people could continue the dialogue. Yes, so, so if you didn't so hear. We'll find out. You want to keep the conversation going, yeah. and Alicia will be here to talk further. Um, thank you Thank so you. Much for Thank you.